Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. If you're paying attention, you know that you only make money when you work. It might be great money, but it's dependent on you. The information on this podcast will help you solve that. We interview experts and provide analysis into financial freedom through commercial real estate. Why? To help physicians like you thrive. Let's dive in. Welcome back to Surgeon Syndicate. This is your host, Dr. Michael McManus, and we are back with the second half of our interview with Chris Larson. Chris, welcome to the show. Dr. Mike, good to see you again. Thanks for being here. So when we finished up before, you had talked about uh, an opportunity fund. I'm looking here and, and I'm, I'm yeah. seeing that you know, you've done some private lending and distressed debt. And I think this is a, a hot topic in the real estate world right now. And some docs I talk to, they're worried they missed the boat. They look and they saw you know, that multifamily had this, this huge rise while rates were low. And you see stories in the newspaper and they're like, oh, now's a bad time to be in real estate. I missed the boat. But as the world changes, there's different opportunities. So, so tell Absolutely. me a little bit more about you know, opportunity funds and distressed debt, uh, distressed properties and what might be coming down the, what's going on now that could be a bigger opportunity than we saw the last 10 years. Yeah, no, that, that just spurned, you, you want to see me kind of jump out of the picture here. I grabbed a book that I want, I'm going to share here to talk a little bit about. Um, but yeah, so in, in my book, I talk about opportunity fund, which is if you think about it, like, what are you going to do with your capital? What are you going to do with your money while you're waiting for a deal or in between deals? Um, and you know, something that I discovered uh, about, well, geez, my son is, he'll be 14. Um, and we started before he was born. So over 14 years ago now, but we started using cash value life insurance to use as a place to store our capital. And, you know, one of the things that I, I love about you know, cash value life insurance is not only the ability to kind of like store your capital and earn a return on your capital. So that means, you know, if you're getting five or 6% in, in an area, well, maybe you're not as pressured to go after a deal, you know, if your money was sitting in a bank earning 0%. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm a fan of it that way. But also, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a doctor, if you're a surgeon, you know, you're already facing enough risk when you go out and, you know, operate every day because, you know, patients and I have friends that are, are surgeons that have, they've been, you know, brought into a lawsuit. It's like, you don't need more exposure, more liability that's out there. One of the nice things about life insurance is it's a private contract. So you can get these benefits of the insurance policies, but they're private. So people can't kind of pry in, see what you have in there. I was also very nice from a, an estate planning perspective. Um, so we leverage, we leverage that money. That's, that's what we use our opportunity fund for. Um, but whether you do that or another strategy, I think it's important to have an area where you have your capital and it's not burning a hole in your pocket, right? So you know, you know there's an opportunity cost, but it, there's also a return that you're getting. So um, that's that's our that's kind of my my philosophy on opportunity um, fund. And we have actually under banking on our website, we have a whole um, webinar and, and a white paper. You can check out more on that strategy if it interests you. But then, where are we right now? Like, where are we right now in the real estate cycle? And what are the opportunities that are out there? So um, the book that I was grabbing here, Mike, it's kind of like it's kind of like the Bible in my nightstand. Um, I keep this in in my uh, in my drawer next to my desk here. It's called The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. So if you're listening, and you're not watching. It's by Philip Anderson, and Phil goes back through history and he shows how the real estate cycle repeats. And I'm a data guy. It repeats every eighteen, actually eighteen point six years, if you look at it precisely. And you know, it's kind of like, okay, here's this cycle, but there's cycles throughout nature. There's cycles in the human body. There's cycles in nature. You know, there's there's cycles in in finance. And why is that? You know, one of the big things, and Ray Dalio talks about this, you know, a lot of financial experts talk about this, is credit creation and contraction cycles, right? So if you if you try to say, well, how is credit created? Why does it contract? You know, what happens? Land really sits at the base of a lot of the credit. That revolves out there. So if land prices go up and you can use land to buy a piece of property, you can leverage that property, and then you can sell that property and buy another piece of real estate. What is that doing? You're constantly creating credit and you're creating wealth and it creates more credit. So that expansion adds a lot of fuel to the to the economic fire, if we will. Um, so it's uh, I was gonna say it's very accretive to, you know. The, the wealth of anybody that, that's part of that process. 
So Phil Anderson talks about that in the book. Um, and if you look at the process, if you look at kind of that 18 and a half year cycle, you know, what you find is early on in the cycle, like my wife and I did, we started buying land and building spec homes and doing those things. And then as rents rise, it makes more sense to buy income producing real estate. And as you get and, and develop and do things like that, as you get later on in the cycle, you know, interest rates typically rise, real estate prices are high. So people may be thinking, you know, investors may think, well, now is not a great time to buy real estate. But the fact of the matter, like you said, Mike, is that there's always opportunities that are out there. Right now, I'm a big fan of operating real estate. So this is pieces of real estate that kind of have like a business attached. I would call them operating real estate, like car washes. So we have 30 car wash locations. We have a business. The real estate is very beneficial from a depreciation perspective. Um, it's a piece of real estate, but it's really a business that we're running along with the real estate. Mobile home parks, high degree of operations to become successful. Senior housing, assisted living facilities. Again, highly operational, but you have that business income that supports the real estate income as well. And you still get the benefits of owning that real estate. But all of these businesses, mobile homes, car washes, senior housing, still work today, even at 7 and 8% interest rates, because you have that additional income. And what's great is if you're, if you're relying on a piece of real estate to be sold in the next three to five years, but maybe, maybe it's not a good time to sell. Well, you know, we have, we have mobile home parks that are cash flowing 10% to our investors. So, you know, do I, do I care if I can sell that mobile home park or am I comfortable with a 10 or 12 or 13% cash on cash return that's, that's getting kicked off from that, that real estate. So, um, you know, right now, I think this is a, this is an interesting time. Um, and I think we can kind of also transition into kind of distress and what that may bring up as well. But I'm, I'm a big fan of those types of real estate currently as well. That's awesome. So let's make that transition into distressed assets because, you know, I think a lot of, if you go back to 2021 or even early 2022, a lot of syndicators were offering, you know, amazing returns yeah. and they looked great. And uh, some of those aren't aren't panning out because we were hitting the the top of a cycle. But now, as that cycle shifts and you start to see some distressed assets, what does that mean for an investor who's who's looking right now? Yeah, so you know, if if you look back, you know, ten or so years, we were buying uh, distressed debt. You know, we were buying pools of notes, and you know, what happened was, you know, these these notes were not performing. So we were buying pools of notes from banks at ten, fifteen, twenty cents on the dollar. And now the same, you know, pools are, are 50 cents on the dollar. So it's not a great time to do that. You know, I think the, the cycle will turn and we'll see that uh, come back around again. So, you know, if, if you're an operator that bought a multifamily asset apartment building and it was at a, at a price that was too high and you had too much leverage and now you're struggling, you can't, you can't pay the debt service and, you know, maybe you can't afford to do the value add on that and you need capital to keep your business, to keep your real estate afloat. You know, if you're an investor, you could potentially come in. And we just started actually, it's, it's um, basically a preferred equity fund. We call it our alliance fund. And what we're doing is we are working with operators that we have relationships with that need that capital. And what we're, what we're able to do is we're getting very high preferred returns, 11, 12, 13% to our investors on those returns. And the way we're able to do it is because the general partners, instead of just losing the building and wiping out all investor equity, they're giving up a portion of their equity. They're giving up a portion of their ownership to keep those buildings afloat. So if you're creative and you look for these opportunities that are out there and you say, well, hey, you know, how can I bring value to um, these operators? You can still get the types of returns that we were seeing you know, three, four, five years ago in multifamily, but you have to shift your strategy a little bit. So I wouldn't say I'm necessarily uh, you know, like counter cyclical, but I try to be a little bit in front of where the trend is. So, you know, if, if something was popular five years ago, um, you know, maybe it's it's going to fade in popularity, or you know, it's going to run out its time, and you have to start looking, you know, forward, which is uh, why you know I mentioned some of those other asset classes as well. Well, and that's great. So the, you know, for people who are still new to the whole syndication game, yeah. what happens is. The, the general partner makes a lot of their, the operator of their money of pulling off the business plan. Correct. And so what you're talking about there is they're actually taking some of what 
would have been their profit if it had gone right, but now they're looking at maybe a complete loss. And so they're paying a higher rate to get you to come in and bring in the cash they need to keep the whole project going forward and from not going back to the bank. Correct. Yeah. So let's say, let's say um, I'm a general partner and I own 20 or 30% of a project, but that 20 or 30% ownership is predicated on whether or not I can pay investors you know, their portion. So maybe we have to you know, show investors a 10% return if I'm the owner of that project before I really start to make any money. Well, if we have a, a projected 20% return you know, on a project level, and maybe investors get that 15%, and as an operator, you know, I'm getting, say, five, that 5% of the 20%, and I'm just using round numbers here, and you come to me and say, hey, you're going to be wiped out. How about we split the back-end profit, that 5% you're getting, so now I still get something, and you bring the, the additional capital to keep that project on track. You know, that's a great example. Of, of how that would work in practice. And by bringing that capital, you know, and, and getting some of that, that GP equity on the back end, you can get outsized returns, obviously, because, you know, you're, you're getting a substantial, you know, potential future, you know, benefit um, from that. It's a great example. There's often win-win situations because yeah. it yeah. sounds like you're taking part of their profit, but actually you're saving it from becoming a loss and splitting exactly the, right. the, the project you brought back to life. Yeah, so that's exactly right. And what, what it actually does. So if you're an LP investor and you're thinking, well, I'm in a project like that, it actually, it typically, you know, in the projects that we're seeing, the, the limited partners are still getting a return in the, in that expected range. Maybe it's a hundred or 200 basis point decrease in, in project returns to those limited partners. But that would be, that's significantly more than if they were wiped out or, or cut their return in half, for instance. So you've been in almost every asset class but I, I don't see some of my well some of my favorites there uh like retail and industrial yeah. um have you have you played in that area also yeah great great question i don't i don't have an aversion to retail or industrial um you know our our expertise was has been in multifamily for about 10 years and that kind of spun off into self storage as well which is uh, very similar i mentioned how mobile home parks are similar to that as well we have a certain amount of bandwidth that we can have, so it's kind of led me, you know, towards areas that I like. But um, I think I think there's some big opportunities in retail, especially like maybe smaller retail strip malls and those sorts of things, because you know these are these are typically very well located, and you know we're not talking about big box, you know, um, like uh, shopping centers, but I'm talking about like retail in your prime, neighborhood retail center. Yeah, like prime markets like you can't recreate that space right and we you know you're seeing you know you can probably attest to this you can see double digit cap rates in those spaces right now um industrial i think the trends with um you know decentralization when it comes to shipping and you know you have these warehouses that are all around the country as we rely more on amazon and those types of models um you know it's it's hard to keep up especially if you look at the development that has occurred in places like texas and florida and the southeast like we need more industrial, we need more like cold storage, which is a special type of industrial. So I've definitely looked into those areas. I've researched those areas. We just haven't, you know, done anything from a, a general partnership or operating perspective in those areas to date. And so that's more of just saying, okay, what we what we're gonna do, we're gonna do well. And when your model that you've been using, it 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 was easy to shift it from apartment buildings to mobile home parks but it didn't shift well to go into these other spaces. Yeah, we're just the timing. The timing wasn't aligned and, you know, we had a different opportunity that, that presented itself. So, um, you know, for instance, we have, we have a senior housing opportunity currently. We have a mobile home park um, acquisition, which actually, I'm not sure when this airs, but like actual date today, we'll be, we'll be touring that facility tomorrow. Um, we have our, our preferred equity, our alliance fund that we launched. And we also have a car, two car washes that we're, we're finalizing right now. So, um, you know, you want to, you want to stay on track with everything that you're doing. And we have grown into more of a, you know, a real estate specific private equity firm, but, you know, I think retail and retail and industrial may be, may be in our future, but, um, we just haven't gotten to those at the moment. Oh, that's great. Well, we're usually about a month out by the time it airs. So if, if yeah. somebody hears this and they yeah. want to get a hold of Chris, they can find out where the mobile home park is. Absolutely. So mobile yeah. mobile home parks are interesting because it's 
you know, all these communities are, they talk about workforce housing and affordable housing, <laughs> yet mm. nobody, but a lot of them don't like mobile home parks. So, you know, no. new getting a new mobile home yeah. park built is almost impossible. So, yeah. And on a large scale it is. Yeah. And so when you look at some of these mobile home parks, is, is this a big value add with some of the older established parks that are available right now? Yeah. So again, I think uh, in, in the first episode that I was on your show here, we talked a little bit about how um, mobile homes are, in my view, kind of like multifamily. You know, they're kind of like a, a version of multifamily. And, you know, the, the issue is you have a lot of, you know, not in my backyard, NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. So people have an aversion. And I've seen this actually too, from investors too. They're like, well, I don't want to invest in a mobile home park. It's like, well, well, why? Like, why is that? And I think people think that, you know, there's a certain, and a lot of times uh, what I find is those individuals, they've never stepped foot on a mobile home park property. Um, I, when I was uh, in my youth group growing up, we used to go to Appalachia and we would, we would improve a lot of homes that people lived in. And most of the time they were mobile or modular homes. And this is, it's cause it's the most affordable thing that's out there. Um, so I, I can appreciate, you know, especially, you know, if you're a accredited investor and you make a lot of money, you know, you probably haven't spent a lot of time in a mobile home park. Um, that's not necessarily, you know, um, the absolute, but it's it's a generality for sure. The other issue is, you know, if you're here in Asheville, North Carolina, where I am, Asheville says, well, we need more affordable housing, but we don't want mobile home parks. And why would you not want mobile home parks from a municipality or a town or a city? And it's not necessarily the highest and best use from a tax base either, because you're going to get more money from a house, you know, a mobile home is, is technically a depreciating asset, you know, so you have that lot rent, but you're not going to have the same tax base as if you had housing apartments or, or even affordable homes, like three, $400,000, for instance. So you have kind of, you know, you have the, 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 um, the pull on both sides, you have the pull from neighborhoods of people that not, might not necessarily want that near them. And then you have the pull from, you know, the cities that would rather have something different. And what's happening is, you know, those two forces, what they're doing is they're actually squeezing the supply. So on a year over year basis, we have less mobile home parks than we did the year before. So again, you know, I'm, I'm a numbers guy. If I'm thinking supply and demand and demand for affordable housing is going up and supply of the specific type of affordable housing is going down, I want to be in that space because, you know, like the stock market, that's like your PE ratio, right? Supply is going down, demand's going up. That means prices are typically going to go up. Now, how do we, what type of strategy do we use in this space? We are going after in partnership with, uh, you know, my friend and operator here, here in Asheville over parks that are typically less than $10 million or portfolios that are less than $10 million. So typically like two to 5 million, the one we're um, buying in South Carolina is uh, under contract for just over $7 million for, for four parks. And what we do is we go after parks, Mike, that are, are very under managed. And what I mean is they're typically 50 to 75% occupied. Now, why would you want to buy a park that's 50% occupied? They're not great cap rates, four, five, 6% cap rates, but that's as is. So if you can come in and you can put homes or recruit residents that have homes to your park, you can increase income dramatically. And what we do is we actually have an in-house financing arm with our partner. And what we do is we can, we can own or finance homes. We bring in homes, we own or finance them. A resident can come in, either buy the home or rent the home. We typically like to, like to sell it. So it's not a park owned home, it's a tenant owned home. And, and what that does is it rapidly increases income. And then what we can do is we can refinance these parks within typically two to three years and, and return 100% of investor capital while achieving eight, nine, 10 plus percent cash flows to investors. So it provides you know, really, really nice returns for investors. Um, the parks aren't real big. So bigger groups, bigger institutional groups aren't interested. And banks don't like to lend to parks that are only 50% occupied. So we do a lot of seller financing, which works in today's higher interest rate environment. So there's an example of how are higher interest rates good for real estate? Well, if you're selling and you can get a six, seven, eight percent interest rate, if you own or finance to us, that's good for you as a seller. You delay your tax bill, you get a nice return on your money. 
years, like five years ago, you weren't doing that at 4% interest rates. So, you know, you add all of those things together. Um, and what we do is we've actually created a fund. So, you know, we have um, just under 500 lots in that fund to date. Uh, our target is 1,500 to 2,000 lots in that fund. So investors are going to get really nice diversification, really nice cash flows. Um, and we have parks all across the Southeast, as well as uh, Kansas, Ohio, and uh, Missouri as well. So that's a, a great point. We talked a little bit about the, you know, the stigmas of parks. So as an investor, you're getting a 10%-ish a return, which is pretty good, especially when you look at what the stock market's doing right now and, and what you're helping provide. So if you're filling in this park that, that was half full and somebody, you bring in the, the mobile home and, and you park it there and you sell it to somebody. So for them, it's a new home. That's right. What, what's the cost of buying a new home yep. in this scenario? Yes. Yeah, so we like we can also buy used homes. So we're typically we're typically looking at purchasing um, mobile or modular homes between ten and fifty thousand dollars, but more in that median range, twenty thirty thousand um, dollars is, is more typical. Is how is what we is what we typically do. And so, a, a new mobile home, somebody could get a a, a new home for under fifty thousand dollars. Under fifty thousand dollars, that's right. And where else are they going to get a new home for under, for under fifty thousand yeah. dollars? That's I mean, right. that's pretty cool. Yeah. And there's part that's of the stigma cool. yeah. that now they own the home, they pay rent on the lot. That's what right. do you take better care of? Something you own or something that somebody else owns? Yeah. And and that's a different Excellent environment point. and a lot of yeah. mobile home parks that goes against, I think, the standard thought of what it is. Because whenever you see a mobile home in a movie, it's usually the... Uh, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. It's... You don't you don't see the luxury mobile home parks that they have in Florida, or they don't see the parks like the ones we bought in Kansas. You don't see the ones you know that we're looking at in South Carolina that you know are, are nice. Like they have infra like they have infrastructure. The roads are nice. You know, um, some of these communities that that we've been to, like you know, they they have they have fences and private dog yards and ponds and Wi Fi included. And you know, that's that's not necessarily the norm for what we do, but that's not what people typically think of. And you know the other thing, Mike, you brought up a great point. You know, it, it kind of creates this U-shaped return profile or performance profile. In in and again, I put this kind of in the multifamily space because you know if you have a Class A property, you know it typically performs very well. You have high collections. As you go down the spectrum, you get into subsidized housing, C C class properties. You know they don't perform as well, especially during downturns. But mobile home parks do perform well during downturns. Why is that? If you own the home, it's going to cost you five thousand dollars to move a home. Are you not going to pay your two, three, four hundred dollar a month lot rent and lose your home, or are you going to pay five thousand dollars and move your home down the road? Which we're typically at the lower end of lot rents in an area that we buy because, as I mentioned, we're buying underperforming parks. And you know, someone may be listening, saying, "Well, it's it's not fully occupied because your rents are too high." No, it's not fully occupied because the the owner has either owned it for a long period of time and they don't have the capital to infuse to improve the park or bring in the homes and they're not raising rents because they can't lose any more residents that are there and they're probably getting decent cash flow. So we typically, you know, are are in a really good spot even during recessions and downturns because of all those factors. You know, that's an interesting point about the uh the sellers, because that's the demographic we're talking about now of where the world's going is there's a good number of aging baby boomers across asset spectrums who are now, uh, who are looking to retire and are selling, but for the, maybe if for the last 10 or, or more years, if, if somebody's 75 and at 65, they kind of retired, they, you know, turned their real estate engine off and went on coast. And, and and as you get older, if you've got all your insurance set, your actual spending goes down. Right. Um, and so the these assets, whether it's a, a neighborhood retail center or a mobile home park or a little apartment building, is still churning off money and it and it often is enough money. And right. you're getting older, you're not as interested in messing with it. You have enough money. And so this asset kind of decays in under management 
And it doesn't mean the building often decays, especially, you know, a lot of assets. Well, the mobile home park that if you're moving in new new homes, the the old homes that may have been there 10 years ago have decayed and gone away, but the park is still fine. That's right. Or, yeah. yeah, or it needs, you know, it needs some infrastructure improvements, um, maybe new paving. Um, you know, these these are all things that take, like, let me give you an example. So, because what you said is exactly right. We bought five parks in Tennessee, right across the border from where I live in North Carolina last year. And we bought them from two brothers. And these brothers were school teachers. And one, I think it had moved into administration. The other was like um, the, the uh, school's football coach. So, you know, they'd, they'd been around and they were getting towards retirement. And we bought these parks from them for about $2 million. Well, you know, let's say they were getting $100,000 a year in cash flow. That's, that's a, you know, if you do the math, that's a 5% cap rate on the price we paid. But let's say they only paid a half a million dollars for those parks. That's a 20% cap rate from what they paid. So, you know, they're thinking, hey, $500,000 we paid for these five parks. We're getting $100,000 a year. We're splitting it, you know, plus, you know, making, you know, decent um, salaries as, as, as uh, teachers, administrators. That ain't bad. Well, for them to invest another half a million dollars, you know, in cash wasn't feasible for them to get where, where the parks needed to be. You know, so we were able to raise the capital to buy those parks, raise the capital to, you know, make the improvements in those parks and bring, as we were talking about earlier, more homes into the parks. You know, all those things are, are going to improve the value. But a large group that's buying mobile home parks, they're not going to mess with, you know, five little parks that cost $2 million. And, you know, mom and pops that are own 85% of these parks aren't going to be able to come in and do what we do as a larger group, you know, that's, that's able to raise five plus million dollars you know, per acquisition. So yeah, it's, uh, again, using the demographic trends, you know, not just from, you know, the, the renters or the residents profile, but also from the seller's profile, you know, helps us target these parks and where to buy those. Um, and the nice thing is these, these parks work pretty much anywhere in America. Now you want to, you want to be in areas that are, you know, thriving like Dayton, Ohio, which is where one of our acquisitions is outside of Greenville, South Carolina. Like this is where we want to buy, but Typically, affordable housing works in almost any area that has a decent economic base in this country. That's great. And the the guys leaving, so they paid a half a million dollars for it. They were making a hundred thousand dollars a year on it. Now they sell at two million. They feel like winners. That that oh yeah, that they split a, two million bucks because <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's legit, right? <laughs> that was a, not a bad way to head into retirement. Yeah, exactly. Well. Is there anything else? So we've been through a bunch of stuff here. Anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? For for do most of our listeners are doctors, but we've we've got some other people out there that I've talked to. I've been surprised that are engineers and tech people. But yeah. um, any any last pearls of wisdom you'd like to share with them? Yeah, thanks for that opportunity. This has been look. First off, I love your I love your logo too. By the way, um, with the surgeon the surgeon syndicate that's, that's oh, thank in the you. back. Um, and look, we, we really love working with, with professionals. You know, I spent almost, uh, 20 years, 18 years in the medical device profession, worked with, you know, really hundreds of, of doctors and surgeons over that period. Um, please get a free copy of our book at nextlevelincome.com. You can click on the book link. We'll send you a free copy. Um, if you put your address in there, we're launching a new eight week coaching course, group coaching course in the new year. And if you go and you click on the resources link under coaching, um, you'll see you'll see all the details that are that are up there. Um, you can get our online course with a code next level at five hundred dollars off. So we try to have free resources, coaching programs. And then if you're listening, you're like, Chris, how do like how do I get involved with some of these things? You can click on the invest link and schedule a call with our team to see if this this might be a good fit for what you're looking for. And a key thing there is that won't be a sales call. They're going to find out if what they got is a good fit for you. That's so. exactly right. Yeah, we we want to make sure that it goes both ways. You know, we want to learn our investors, and yeah, we don't. I don't have a sales team. You know, we have an investor relations team, and you know, we want people that you know think this is a good fit for them, and we let we let them make those choices. Because unhappy investors are more work than they're worth. So <laughs> you want a good fit as Absolutely. much as they want a good fit. <laughs> Indeed. So, all right, Chris, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. Mike, thanks for having me. It's been a blast. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks for joining us today on the Surgeon Syndicate and join us next time. This has been an episode of Surgeon Syndicate. If you got value from this episode, you know other surgeons are hungry to become job optional. 
and you can help them by sharing this content today. Schedule a call and we can make a plan. Looking forward to having you with me on the next episode.